and we're doing 10 minute slots in the first round. Thank you very much. And thank you, gentlemen. Are there any women um, in this organisation? or do, Were women involved in any of this decision-making process? Just as a pre-question. Certainly uh, mm -hmm. plenty of women definitely yeah. on, on the, the, the project team. And, uh, in the Project Eagle, in the Project Eagle process? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, they, they were like they certainly. Uh, they, don't seem working, they don't seem evident anymore. Working on the on the Project Eagle team that that, that executed the deal all right, and uh, obviously our, our our head of our head of legal is is uh, Aideen O'Reilly as well. But, okay. but the head of legal is female. Yeah. Okay. Now, just in relation to this, I, as I said before, we now have another ten pages before us. Very soon, the pages from NAMA are going to exceed the uh, actual report. And you haven't addressed one of the issues. You've simply zoned in once again on the 5.5% and the 10%, and you've once again said that the controller and auditor general is inappropriately used this. And really, at this point, I'm exasperated because he, he'd be coming back in due course to answer. But what we've read, he didn't pick any 5.5 out of the sky. He picked it from your board, picked it from minutes, and he's made comments and conclusions that you didn't justify your decisions. You didn't show evidence for your decisions, you didn't back up your decisions, you didn't look at alternatives. So I'm not going to waste my five or ten minutes going through all of that again because I've put it repeatedly to the different NAMA witnesses. And I would have thought at this point that if you were coming in with ten pages, you might go through chapter three, chapter four and deal with what he raised if the Project Eagle loan sale process and the other chapter the basis for the decision to sell the Northern Ireland debtor loans, and then the conflict of interest. Three major areas. I, I would have expected you to go through all of that. You've had five draft reports. You've had ample opportunity, and we're now at the end of October, and I don't see one of the concerns raised. So I'm going to use my time just now to zone in on the conflict of interest. And which of you gentlemen would have been present when the phone call took place with PIMCO? I was present for the Great. Phone calls, yes. Mr Stewart. And who was present with you? On the PIMCO, from NAMA side? Or from, from any from, side. From NAMA side. Well, on from any side. Who was in your presence when you were participating? In my direct yeah. presence yeah. in the room, yeah. there was Ronnie Hanna, who was head of asset recovery, okay. for the 10th of March call. Uh, likewise, on the 11th of March, the first call, which is the morning call. I'm going to take the first call. Yeah, okay. The first call, because there, there, there are about five calls. There are uh, five calls, Good. one on the 13th, which kind of falls outside. Yeah, of we're Pendicity. going to go through each one of those now. So let's, let's go through each one. And on the 10th, the first one is on the 10th. Correct. That's right. Okay. And is that correct to say that that phone call fo follows on from a request by PIMCO on the 7th of October? So it came from PIMCO. To, they, they needed to talk to you or the legal team about something, is that right? Yes, what happened was the head of legal in PIMCO left a voicemail for my manager yes. on the 7th seeking a, a call. A, a call was scheduled then for 4pm on the Monday, which was the 10th. Yes. Um, my manager was unable to attend, she had an appointment that day, so she asked would I sit in with Mr Hanna for that call. So, so that just two of you were there? That's correct. Okay, Nanny, yes. uh, uh, what, was the, what was said to you? What was said on the call was, first of all, PIMCO opened by thanking us for, 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 for arranging the call, and they said that they want, they had outlined the fee arrangement, which you're familiar with, obviously, that there was a, to be a three-way split between Brown Rudnick, Tuhans, and Frank Kushnahan of this success fee that they said was paid. And this was paid. the first time you heard about this? Absolutely, yes. Okay, and it came as a shock to you? Absolutely, Great. Okay. yes. And uh, they asked, were we aware of this? Yeah and immediately responded and said no, which was Mr Hanna's reaction and my reaction. No, we were not aware of this. And then from there, the call went into a question about how did you become aware of it in PIMCO? And they told us about, in broad terms, that they had become aware of it on... Uh, but this is the legal team, remember, that we were talking yeah. to in PIMCO, no one from the commercial side. But the legal team in PIMCO had become aware of it when they first lo started looking at the letter of engagement with Brown Rudnick. And that's when the three-way split came to light. Okay. So that's how that passed. And then the call concluded. I'm just sorry, I'm going to refer periodically yep. to my notes, yep. if you don't mind. These are, by the way, are based on handwritten notes, the call. I think you have a copy of them from what was provided last night, and you have them for all I don't calls. have it now, and if you're going to refer oh. to them, I really would like it if you're going sure. to. Yeah. No. Can we get those up? Is there a reference to those if we have them on our system? <laughs> I mean, I mean, the, the heading, the heading on, the, on the one he just talked about is, is record one and what was sent down, if that's any assistance in locating it. I, mean, I should add Appendix E is, is a useful guide as yeah, well. We have appendix I don't if we could work yeah. from Appendix E, because that's, that's what's been disclosed to us, that's what we have. Sure, well, I, okay, I'll do that, I'll do that then. Like it. 
Uh, and, and by the way, I don't take issue with what's in Appendix E. It largely is consistent with what's in my calls. There's a little bit more in my notes, but that probably was That's great. So you're, you're, you're confirming what's in Appendix E? Yes. That's interesting now, because Mr Daly isn't quite happy, I think, with Appendix um, E. But we'll come back to him on that. Well, but you're, you're confirming Appendix E as is. You've read it. Looking at my notes and comparing them to what's in Appendix E, I'm broadly happy with what's in Appendix great. E. That is, is there anything you disagree with it? Yeah, well, well one point which yeah. I can, I can address now, if you wish. You address it now, yeah. Yeah, okay. The one point I suppose I would take a little bit of issue with is just the use of a footnote for the context that I gave to a, a, a particular um, yeah. point that was raised. Um, there, was, well, there was two footnotes, in fact. Yeah, number one um, or two. It's, yeah. it's more, it's more the, the, the fact that they were, used as foot, they were put as footnotes. I mean, I was on the calls. I do recall what the context was, and I felt it would have been appropriate to elevate it to the actual body text okay. as opposed to a footnote. But that's, well, that's, well, that's my impression. But you're not taking issue with the accuracy? No. Well, that's great. And I, I have them marked here and I have them read, so and I'm sure all the other members have it read. Okay, well, I'll work yeah. from those then, great. so rather great. than confuse we'll, things yeah. with, with, with what you received last night. Yeah. Okay, so, so obviously then at that point in the call, we explained to um, PIMCO, the question was asked, well, if this is an issue for PIMCO, what does that mean for PIMCO in this process? This is what was asked, and that's, uh, I have that in my notes. That mightn't be clear from Appendix E, but you will see that from my notes. No, I, I'm not going to talk about your notes. We sure. don't have them. I'm talking about Appendix E, if you don't mind, just to keep it clear for me now. I understand, yeah. but, but okay. I, I just, just to say that you, have, you will have my notes, but I just want to make that point again. <laughs> You're here you before me. But, sorry, no, Chair. It is difficult. We, I have ten minutes. Four have gone. And I haven't moved. Now, please, just that's what's before me. That's what I've read in detail. Of course, but it, take it, me through Appendix E. It is important that I that I that I deal with it. And obviously, I'm happy to come back another day. No, but you've if you have questions, it. Deputy, no. that you don't get to, I'm more than yeah. happy to come back. Another I, day. I, I don't wish to be argumentative, but we are under a time pressure, and you have confirmed you have no problem with these notes except for the note. Sure. So let's work through the Appendix E. Okay. okay. So what was then said, and I think this is mentioned in Appendix E, is if, if NAMA considered the fee arrangement to be an issue that PIMCO would have concerns over continuing to deal with the three counterparties involved and would well, need just, to sorry, just tell me, you, were, you had the phone call, you, got, yes. you were shocked. Yes. What happened next? Well, what happened next was we asked how did it come to light yeah, and explained We heard that all that. And what did you do with that information? Then with that information, so after the call. Yeah. We took the information back to the board, yes. and there was a phone call with the board the next morning. There was a meeting, and I think the board. Who did you contact on the board with that information? I believe there was a call put through to the chairman, okay. and then a board meeting was convened for the following morning. Okay, so you told the chairperson, and presumably he called a meeting. Correct. Okay, and we have the minutes of that meeting. You do. Yes. And as a result of that meeting, I think you were to go back and talk to Pimco. That's correct, and okay. to relay the board's position to Pimco, which is yeah. what we then did. Yes. So then you have the call on the. 11, the 11 a.m. call on the 11th of March, okay. which was directly after the board meeting. Okay. And on that call, again, it's quite, it's, it's quite a short call, that one. We simply relayed the board's position that this was a very serious issue for NAMA. That was put back to PIMCO, and could PIMCO reflect on this? Uh -huh. Okay. So then, shall I continue with the other question? Yeah. Um, then, uh, that evening, there was a call uh, with PIMCO again. <coughs> I think we may have missed a call from them and we're returning it that evening at five o'clock, but anyway. Yeah. Um, and what they did in that call was to express their disappointment yeah. that disclosures of interest that they thought would have been made yeah, had not, had been, not made. been made. Yeah. Yes, and then they went on to say that they were willing to withdraw completely from the process. Yeah. Um, and that was the way they put it, that they were willing to withdraw from the process. <coughs> um, and then there followed a query about whether they had considered other options, and this was a reference back, and I'm quite clear in my mind that it was a reference back to what had been said on the 10th of March call, where PIMCO had referenced the possibility that they would need to consider with the business that if this was an issue for NAMA, that they would explore other options. And that's what Mr. Hannan then referred to when he said, have you considered other One options? One second, we've gone through the 10th of March, and that yes. wasn't said. That, well, that, that, that wasn't said, is that no, it is, Well, I'm, actually, Deputy, it is in Appendix is E. Okay, Let me yeah. refer you to the line, if I yeah, may. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the last paragraph uh, there on yep. the, the, I think it's I'm not sure the page, the first page of Appendix E, shall we yep. say, and you see there, PIMCO confirmed that its legal due diligence would not proceed until NAMA's position was clarified. So that's the actual legal due diligence in the legal data room. Yep. And that if NAMA considered the fee arrangement to be an issue, PIMCO would have concerns over continuing to deal with the three counterparties and would need to consider if the, traction, if the, the transaction could be progressed without their involvement. Without, without their involvement, yeah. And what's missing from that is that they would need to consider with the business that is a reference to the fact that the legal team doesn't have the ability to make those kind of decisions on its own. With, no, the, the transaction could be progressed without their involvement. Without their involvement, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the possible option of that yeah. was what I believe Mr. Hanna was referring back to on the 11th of March at the afternoon call. And then he went on to say, well, could it, when they asked what other options was he referring to, 
the text is that he could it be shaped differently for the arrangement fee to come out. And what that is a reference to, I believe, is a reference to removing the three counterparties. Mm -hmm. Because obviously that's, it, it says the same thing in a different way to my mind. This is what Mr. Hanna asked for. Mr. The... Hanna, yes, mm -hmm. that's right, yes. Yeah. Um, and that the concern of the board, the core concern of the board, was the fact that Frank Kushnahan was a potential beneficiary mm -hmm. from this fee. Mm -hmm. And that was related. And indeed, that's consistent with what's in the board minutes. And then they mentioned the fact that at that point they, they raised the point that a third of the fee was in fact payable to a named individual in, in Tuhans and that they were again willing to withdraw from the process. Okay. So at every stage PIMCO was up front. They initiated it from the 7th of March. Through the phone calls they confirmed it. They said they were disappointed that there had been no disclosure to NAMA yeah. and then they said they had no option but to withdraw. Yes, and, and, and what that's, they said at a number okay. of points was that they wished to be transparent and upfront. That's okay. That. So that, that confirms exactly what's there. Thank you for that. Now, in relation to Lovells, who were your legal advisors? Hogan and Lovell? Hogan Lovells, yes. They were advisors on the loan sale, yes. That's okay, right. what were they paid? Um, I think it was just over a million pounds, okay. I think, for their... And were they ever the asked work. about a conflict of interest in relation to how to handle the conflict of interest? Well, the scope of their work was to deal with the loan sale process and, yeah. and, and the data room and dealing with queries and whatnot. So it, um, it never arose that they would be, ha, have been asked about their opinion about PIMCO withdrawn and subsequently... No, well, there uh, is an in-house legal function in NAMA, so we would be able to deal with those type of okay. issues. So is that you then? And your, yes, and, and my, your my, my manager, who's the head of legal. All right. Okay. And, and, and a number of others. I mean, there's, there's more of the team, obviously. Yeah. And so it was your role rather than Lovell's, is it? Hogan's and Lovell? Yes, and there is a compliance unit in the NTMA as well. Okay. I think reference is made right. to that in the report also. Okay. And did you see a problem with the payment to Kushnahan? Of course. Okay. Tell me how you... Well, when I sat on the call on the 10th of March, I didn't know who Frank Kushnahan was, yeah. to, to be quite honest with you, Deputy. Uh, I knew the name. I knew that he was from the Northern Ireland and that he was on the Northern Ireland Advisory Committee, and that was it. Yeah. I wasn't aware of any conflicts of interest or involvement with debtors yeah. or what... Well, when it came to your attention? Well, it came to my attention afterwards, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. And what, was your, what yes. was your role then? Well, at that point in time, uh, the, the board uh, had given us their view and PIMCO expressed its willingness, willingness to withdraw and the next day said it was withdrawing. Yeah. So... Were you uh, asked for an opinion on this? Yes, and okay. my opinion and was, was your opinion? that under no circumstances from a reputational point of view yeah. could this type of arrangement be let proceed. Yeah. That was my view at the time. And was that written in a written format or verbally? Or? I, w I was present at the board meeting on the, on yeah. the 11th at 10 a.m. and I would have expressed the view at that, at that stage. At I, no I think that was the, the uniform view, by the way. Okay. And then in relation to Cerberus and taking on the same legal advisors and one set of property advisors, mm -hmm. were you asked for a view in relation to that? When that uh, issue came to light, I actually wasn't aware of it. I, my, our second daughter was born on the 30th of March, so I was off work from the 1st of April. So I didn't know of Cerberus retaining Brown, Rudnick and Tuans. Indeed, I only found out about that mid-last year. But who, who in the office found out? Who, you know, somebody stepped into your shoes when you stepped out. I believe, and I'm looking at these emails second-hand, I believe that the interaction was, first of all, with the head of asset recovery between him and, and Mr. Cerberus. Mr Hannah. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And then um, I think he would have consulted with the CEO and I just, think... We want to think sorry. here. I just want... Mm -hmm. You had nothing to do with this? No. OK. Who had in the legal side? Who were the legal side asked about Cerberus taking on the same solicitors? Yeah, I know that there was uh, discussions with my manager, who's the head of legal, and that ultimately uh, resulted in the approach taken, which was to get this, uh, this form of... And when were you made aware of that, or your office, or My your first boss? awareness <laughs> of it... Not was, you personally okay. now, but whoever was taking the decisions. Uh, that was the 3rd of April, I believe. Are you sure of that now? Well, the email from Cerberus saying that they were retaining Brown Rodnicks was the third. You April see, th th this is important, really. Here we have Cerberus taking over the same set of solicitors and taking over the same property advisors. And you're coming before us here today to, and I want to ask questions about how the conflict of interest was followed up. And the reason I want to do that is not to be argumentative, but sure. because the controller and auditor general raises it. Of course. And he makes specific conclusions in relation to the further steps should have been taken. Of course. So I'm asking you now, if you can't, then we'll get the appropriate witness. If you can't, so are you not in a position to help us here in relation to? Not in relation to the, the interaction of the 3rd of April, I'm not, afraid. Nothing about, including the 3rd of April. Any, what, what person in the office was approached for advice in relation to whether this is appropriate that Cerberus have the same solicitors? 
It, OK, I, I imagine it was the head of legal. Which you can tell us. I can't. On okay. that specific one, I can in relation to the PIMCO. Thank you. I know I'm asking for Cerberus. Okay. Yeah, the, the, we've dealt with the PIMCO. You might come back in the Cerberus. I'm, I'm going to finish up. The, yeah, just, two, just two questions I want to finish up on. Are you aware when um, a bidder <coughs> comes forward to bid that the financial advisor, like Lazard in this case, they would set out how, the, what responsibilities are on the bidder? Yes. Okay. And what responsibility would have been on Cerberus in relation to disclosure? Well, they would have been expected to make their bid in a way that was compliant with the process letter. That's I'm talking about their advisors now, their advisors. What, what obligation would have been on them in relation to disclosing who their advisors were? Oh, in terms of, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, in order to access the data room, they had to inform us who their advisors were and there was an obligation on them to put in place a similar form of NDA that they had with us, okay. with their advisors. And did Cerberus inform you that they had taken on the same set of solicitors and the same property advisors, did that come back as part of their obligation prior to the bid? Prior to the bid, the, the, yes, they it had did. taken, yes, the legal advisors that Cerberus retained prior to the bid, who were very active in the data room on their behalf, were Linklaters and ANL Goodbody, okay. who were two other firms. Okay. And that's partially why I was shocked when I heard last year that Cerberus were retaining Brown Rudnick, because I couldn't understand why they would have a need to retain another legal firm when they had two full service firms so active for And them. had they told you? Had they told you that they had retained Brown, Brown Rudnick? They told us, I believe the first they told us was the 3rd of April. That's we, the email we, I have that's seen. A, okay. This gentleman yeah. wasn't there that day. Yeah, so no, no, I'm asking about Somebody else will yeah. come yeah. back to it. Our understanding, certainly my understanding was that, that only be, we only, only became aware of that on the 3rd of April. You see, that's the point I'm asking. There's an obligation on the bidder, according to the, his obligations when he or she is bidding, to say who their advisors are and write it out before the bid. No, I think they did. Yeah. For you, Deputy. The obligation arises in order to facilitate access to the data room. So they have to uh, tell us who their advisors are in order for those parties to then be facilitated in accessing the data room. Brown Rudnick, so far as I am aware, never accessed the data room okay. in their capacity as an advisor to Cerberus. Okay. And that's an important point. That is important because if, if that's the position, and we'll come back to it, you're saying there was no obligation except only specifically in relation to the data room. And I just want to ask Mr. Collison one question, last question, in relation to the bid process. And you you haven't addressed any of the issues, but in, when you were answering... Sorry, Deputy, in, in what way...? Oh, 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 I can't read them all out. They're all here in the report. I have the time. I'll come back to them in ten minutes. They're all set out in conclusions, one after another. For example, that it wasn't competitive, that the bidders were restricted. You keep talking about nine or ten bidders. There weren't nine or ten bidders. There were three plus... There were three... Deputy, I never mentioned nine or ten bidders. The, the others, other speakers have, and come back. And so it wasn't competitive, it was restrictive. And then you said, actually, this is my last question. You said that if we had underbid, there would have been a lot more bidders. Isn't that what you said? Uh, potentially. But yes, I took a note of what you said. Actually, there were a lot more bidders, and you stopped them. Eight out of ten, ten bidders came forward. Only two were allowed in. On the eight, advice of Lazar. Well, let, let me just. Eight were, eight were refused. So when you make a statement that if we had underbid, there would potentially have been a lot more bidders, there were a lot more bidders. And the process that she set up said, no, we're not taking them. And different reasons were given, set out here. Some, we have given a commitment to the existing bidders that there will be a restricted process was one. A second one, Lazard said, I, they have excellent reputation, seven out of eight, but we can't take you. That's the last question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there weren't eight bidders, there were eight no. parties who expressed a an interest. possible interest. interest. I think it's an important point to make. Yeah, we understand. The point is you said no to them. That's the most important okay. point. We will come back to that. We will come back. Deputy